In this video, we're gonna cover a number of Super Nintendo emulation cores on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. RetroArch comes with around 17 pre-installed Super Nintendo cores for you to enjoy your 16-bit games on. Unfortunately, most of these are older builds of certain cores or less demanding builds of other cores and aren't of any real use on the Xbox Series X or S. As such, out of those 17 cores, there's only four that really need any attention from Series X and S gamers. And we're gonna cover them in today's tutorial on how to get them set up and going. So let's go ahead and dive in. Now, before we get started, this guide is a continuation of my RetroArch install guide. So if you do not have dev mode set up and RetroArch installed, this is the guide for you to check out, get it all going, and then continue along with this guide. So that way you can get everything up and running. Now, as part of this guide, I do go over USB setup as well, but if you already have RetroArch installed, but maybe you don't have a properly formatted USB drive, you can refer to either my RetroArch setup guide itself or one of my USB drive setup guides. They will both get you taken care of, whether you're on Windows or Mac. Now, our one and only required step to getting Super Nintendo games up and running is to acquire some Super Nintendo game ROMs. And the common ones that you're gonna find are in .sfc format or .smc format. For anyone looking to emulate the BSX or the Sufami Turbo, those games will be in .bs or .st format accordingly. Do note that these two games require additional BIOS files that need to go into your RetroArch system folder, which I will not be covering in this video as I do not have access to either of these devices. But acquire the BIOS files, they just need to be named accordingly and then just dragged into your RetroArch system folder. Now, if you happen to have a large physical collection of Super Nintendo games, one of the easiest ways to get those backed up for your emulation purposes is to use the Retro Blaster Programmer from RetroStage. Just a wonderful device, can dump so many different cartridge types, and I cannot recommend it enough. Alternative methods of acquiring Super Nintendo games from your own collection include dumping virtual console ROMs from a modded Wii, Wii U, or 3DS. The Super Nintendo Classic could also be used, or you know, you could always resort to the Googles and find things that way, but as always, piracy is not condoned on this channel, and we do not provide a legal download link, so do not ask. So here's my Super Nintendo games folder with all my games inside of it. Again, SFC is the common dump format, and that is probably your number one go-to. But for anyone interested in doing any MSU1 audio hacks, those do also work on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch, and I recommend keeping those games in a subfolder for all of their audio files. So I have one MSU1 game in today's tutorial, Mega Man X2. And for any of you out there interested in patching your games for use with MSU1 audio, I do have a tutorial on the channel for how to get that set up, and the link will be in the description below. It is also worth noting that you can have your Super Nintendo games zipped, Outside of MSU1 games, I wouldn't recommend zipping those ones up, but if you wanted to have your games in zip format, that is equally valid. And just to give a demonstration here, we'll just add Joe and Mac here to a zip folder. That way you can see it in action here in a bit. But once you have all your games good to go, we just need to add them to our games folder on our Xbox USB drive. So just get that plugged into your PC or other computing device that can read NTFS partitions. Go into your games folder, find your Super Nintendo games folder, add the games to it. Or in my example here, since I'm not using the pre-populated folders that the formatting gives you, I'm just gonna drag my SNES game folder right into it. And there we go, good to go. So now we just need to take the Xbox USB drive out of our computer and put it back in our Xbox and load into RetroArch. With your USB drive in place and RetroArch booted up, we are free to begin playing our Super Nintendo content. So one method of doing so is to head to load content. Navigate down to your E drive here, go into your games folder, find your Super Nintendo games folder, choose a game, and then choose one of the available Super Nintendo cores to run it. So the cores we are going to be covering today are standard BSNES, BSNES HD Beta, SNES 9X, and Messen S. Everything else can basically be ignored as they are just inferior versions of everything else. But rather than go through that long-winded process every time you want to load up a Super Nintendo game, you might be more interested in just creating a game's playlist. So to do this, head over to Import Content, click on Scan Directory, navigate to your Super Nintendo games folder, and tell it to scan this directory. 
And once that scan is finished, all of your Super Nintendo games should be appearing over here in the playlist entry, but if for whatever reason they do not, you can come back in here and do a manual scan. And this time we'll just go ahead and tell it to go to our Super Nintendo games folder again. Tell it to scan this directory. For system name, we'll scroll down to Nintendo. Tell it Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Default core, you could set this to whichever Super Nintendo core you'd like, but if you want to manually choose them later, you could just leave it as unspecified. Now for file extensions, it would be wise to do just your normal SFC file extension. If you know you have games and other extensions like SMC, you could put those in here as well. But if you're doing MSU1 audio games, it will pick up all of the PCM tracks, so you want to make sure that you specify that you only want it to pick up the SFC extension. Next, make sure scan recursively is set to on so it checks your subfolders, and then make sure scan inside archives is on so it checks your zipped up games. Then just go ahead and tell it to start the scan. And your new Super Nintendo playlist entry is here on the left with all of your games inside of it. And hey, look at that, there's our MSU1 game and our zipped up game of Joe and Mac. Excellent. But now to play a game, all you need to do is select it, click on run, and then choose one of the available cores with which to play it. And it will set it as the default core that will run it. So again, BSNES, BSNES HD Beta, SNES 9X, and Messin N are the only four really worth considering. But there we go. And at any time, you can always reset the core association within the playlist entry by going down and pressing A on reset core association. So you can change up cores at will at any time. And depending on if your game is named accurately or not to what the internal RetroArch database is looking for, you could also easily download thumbnails by clicking the download thumbnail button. And when the download completes, your playlist entry will now have thumbnails over on the right. Again, this does require you to have games named according to what the internal database is looking for, otherwise it will just come up with nothing, and you can manually add them in later if desired. We'll go over that in a separate video, however. But anyway, let's go ahead and begin diving into our four cores that we're going to be using in today's tutorial. So the first one we're going to cover is BSNES, the most accurate Super Nintendo core ever created. All right, so there we go. Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island loaded up in BSNES. So again, this is the most accurate Super Nintendo core you can get, but it doesn't support some optional features people might like, like retro achievements, and MSU1 audio support on it is way harder to achieve. But as you can see, it looks absolutely beautiful. I have integer scaling enabled to give it a really sharp presentation, but again, that does result in black borders around the screen, so personal preference on whether or not people like to use that or not. But let's go ahead and dive into some core settings. So going into our RetroArch quick menu here. Now from here, scroll down to core options and our first set of options are in the video tab. And we can set our preferred aspect ratio. So a couple of different versions available here. Pixel perfect, four by three, NTSC, and PAL. So choose whichever one you like. You can leave it set to auto. I am a 4x3 fan, so that is what I typically go with. Next up, crop overscan. So this removes borders at the top and bottom of the screen, which usually has a bunch of garbage data, so you can turn this option on or off. It's on by default. Next, blur emulation. So this is needed for transparency in some games, so I like to turn it on. It doesn't really give much of a performance hit or a visual hit in other games that don't utilize the feature, so I really like to leave this one on to get the most accurate experience possible. Next up, we have filtering options using Blarg's NTSC filter. So we have options to choose from here, including RF. So there we go, RF, Posit, S-Video, and RGB. So you could use these to get a really nice effect or use RetroArch's built-in shaders, totally personal preference. Next up, PPU fast mode. This is set to on by default and lets you access a number of hacks that are listed below it. The first of which being PPU deinterlace. This will render the select few SNES games that ran in 480i and 480p to make them look a lot sharper. Next up, no sprite limit. So just like on NES hardware, when there were too many things happening on a single scan line, the Super Nintendo would introduce flickering on the sprites. So you can enable this option to remove it. So personal preference on which one you prefer. And finally, our last option within the video tab is no VRAM blocking, and this is for older ROM hacks that were built back in the day. 
So if you're planning on playing older ROM hacks, you need to enable this option, otherwise they will not work. Backing out, going to the audio tab. So our first option, DSP fast mode, you can go ahead and leave this one on. Reduces system requirements a bit, so just good to have it on to be safe. Technically a little less accurate, but not noticeably so. This option's followed by cubic interpolation. So this one will adjust how sound output comes across, so personal preference on whether or not you like it on or off. And finally, Echo Shadow RAM. This is another option needed for older ROM hacks. So if you're not using any ROM hacks, you don't have to worry about it. But again, it is only for really old ones that were built back in the ZSNES days. Backing out, HD Mode 7. So in a Mode 7 game, it is defaulted to its 240p state. And I mean, that's what the game looks like. But emulation gives us the power to up-res these. So our first option is to scale up our Mode 7 effects. So, Super Mario Kart here. Now, you may be tempted to go for the full 1920p. But do be aware that it is demanding and will cause a lot of frame rate issues if you go for the max. So you need to be a bit more conservative with this option. And something like 960p is much more achievable and still provides great results, especially when compared to the original 240p output. And of course you could always try to go higher to find out the absolute max that the current game supports. So Super Mario Kart here, for example, is having no problem at 1440p. And even 1680 is not proving to be an issue versus that full 1920 where we saw that it does have issues. So just work your way through the options and find out which one works best for your current game. Again, not all games are created equally when it comes to their performance profiles. Next up, perspective correction. So this will make items appear to look correctly despite the angle you're looking at them in versus uh, the... Uh, shaking you might experience in some SNES Mode 7 effects. Next up, Super Sampling. So this will take your upscaled Mode 7 graphics and sample them back down to native resolution. Can add an anti-aliasing effect, but personal preference on if you like that effect or not. And the last option, HD to SD Mosaic. This one's on by default. You can just check it out, what it looks like with it on or off. I don't personally notice much of a difference in many of the Mode 7 games I play, so just give it a shot with your titles, see what you find. Now our next set of options, emulation hacks and enhancements. So our first option here is for internal run ahead. So BSNES doesn't use RetroArch's run ahead modes, instead relies on its own. So you can set the number of frames that run ahead runs. This is very demanding and can cause issues with higher frames. So typically one or two frames is the go-to here, but you could try it out. And as you can see, when you have too much run ahead, it results in problematic effects. So just give it a shot until you find the run ahead mode that works without adding additional stutter. Like you can see here how the screen scrolling just isn't steady anymore. So for Mega Man X2, one frame ahead is really the best go-to here. It helps reduce input latency and still looks good in the process. Next, coprocessors fast mode. So this reduces accuracy by a little bit to help improve emulation speed. You can just go ahead and leave this one on. And then coprocessors prefer HLE. Leave this one on as well. Otherwise you would need to have BIOS files for all the coprocessors, which we have not covered in this video because they are not mandatory anymore. Next up, hotfixes. This is an option built into BSNES that can just basically hot patch games that were shipped in a broken state. I'm not too familiar with any games that actually need this option, but if you have a game that was just not the best when it was shipped, you can try this option out, see if it fixes any potential game breaking bugs. So next up, entropy. So this is the memory state that is activated when you turn the Super Nintendo on. Low is the most accurate option, but if you want to try seeing what memory addresses can affect in-game things, you can turn it to high or you can turn it off. And our last option is for CPU fast math. This one is only really needed for older ROM hacks once again, so if you're not doing ROM hacks, older ROM hacks at that, you don't need to worry about it. Next up, over and down clocking. So this is where you're going to affect the emulated CPU speeds of different aspects of the Super Nintendo. So the first up is CPU speed. 
So if you have games that experience hardware-based lag because they're doing too much for the Super Nintendo to handle, you can come in here and increase the CPU speed for your emulated titles to get rid of said slowdown. Do note that overclocking can cause crashes and bugs in various titles, so use at your own risk. Next, we have an SA1 coprocessor overclock, so pretty much the same deal if you have an SA1 enhancement chip game that is still running slow, you can come in here and overclock the SA1 chip to get better results, but again, use at your own risk as it can cause crashes. And finally, the same thing for the Super FX coprocessor, and we're going to be using Doom as an example here, so here we go, here's Doom running normally. And if we increase the Super FX uh, processor speed here, all of a sudden you can see that it runs a bit smoother. Not by much for that one. But again, overclocking the FX processor can cause crashes and glitches in some titles, so again, use at your own risk. And we're going to skip over the final two settings tabs within BSNES because while Super Game Boy emulation is cool to see in the core, there's easier ways to get Super Game Boy emulation running on RetroArch through the Xbox Series X and S that we will cover in our Game Boy specific video. And like on settings are something I've never been able to get to work, but that's going to cover it for our BSNES core options. So if there are any options you want to have set for some games, but not others, you can come into manage core options and save them as a game options file. Very useful for those overclock features or HD mode seven. Next, let's go ahead and cover BSNES HD. So going to come in here and select BSNES HD beta. So just like standard BSNES, retro achievements can't be earned within the BSNES HD beta core, unfortunately. But the core remains indistinguishably as accurate as standard BSNES, but it does introduce a couple of new features that players might be interested in that we will cover here in a moment. But as you can see, game's up and running beautifully. But let's go ahead and cover the core options. So going into the RetroArch Quick Menu, Core Options. BSNES HD lets us adjust some luminance, saturation, and gamma values for our emulated titles. So if you want to change the way that your picture output looks, you can mess with these three options. Next, we have Pixel Aspect Correction. So with this option on, it gives us a more representative 4x3 output. Versus if it is off, it is running in the 8x7 aspect ratio that Super Nintendo games internally rendered at before being scaled on a display. So personal preference on whichever you prefer here. I am again a big fan of 4x3. Next up, Crop Overscan. This removes the garbage data at the top and bottom of the screen, and you can select whether you want to have it set to 12 or 8 pixels. So for integer scaling purposes, you may enjoy the 12 pixel option more because it gives you a better full screen representation. Next up, blur emulation. Again, I like to turn this option on. It emulates the blur effects for transparencies that some Super Nintendo games need for accurate graphics. So I really like to leave it on. Doesn't really add a hit to other games. Next up, hot fixes. This is to fix any games that may have shipped with game breaking bugs. Again, not something I am too familiar with. So if you have a game that has a known bug in it, you can try turning this option on to see if it corrects it. Next up, entropy. So this is that memory state when the Super Nintendo is turned on. Leave this one on low for most accurate representation, but if you want to experiment, you can try high or none. Next up, CPU overclocking. So this will help reduce hardware lag on supported titles. So Super Star Wars here, for example, does have some hardware-based lag when you are shooting and doing too much on screen. But as you can see, now there are no more slowdowns, even when the numerous enemies and blaster effects start happening on screen. Game runs at full speed. But again, these options can cause problems with some games, so always use it at your own risk. Next up, CPU Fast Math. This is used for older ROM hacks. If you're not using older ROM hacks, you don't need to turn this one on. Next, we have a couple of overclocking options for our Super FX and SA1 coprocessors. So if you have slowdowns while playing any of those games that use these coprocessors, you can overclock them to get a faster frame rate. Again, use at your own risk as they can introduce bugs or crashes. Next up, PPU video modes. So fast mode is turned on by default. Just go ahead and leave it here so that way you can use things like PPU video deinterlace, which renders the select few games on the Super Nintendo that rendered at 480i and 480p to make them look better. 
This also lets you enable the no sprite limit to get rid of any flickering sprites that may crop up when too many things are happening on a single scan line for Super Nintendo hardware. And finally, we have the no VRAM blocking. So this is for older ROM hacks. It will need to be enabled to make them work. Next up, DSP Audio Fast Mode. You can just go ahead and leave this one on. Next, Cubic Interpolation. This basically filters what the output sounds like, so personal preference whether you like it on or off. And finally, for the DSP options, Echo Shadow RAM, another option needed for older ROM hacks. So if older ROM hacks are not something you're using, you do not need to worry about this option. Next up, Coprocessors Fast Mode. Go ahead and leave this on. And Coprocessors HLE. Go ahead and leave these on. We're going to go ahead and skip over the Super Game Boy BIOS because, again, while it's cool to see Super Game Boy emulation in this type of accurate form, there are easier ways to get the overall effect in dedicated Game Boy emulators. Next up, internal run ahead. So this helps reduce input latency, but it can cause performance issues and visual glitches depending on if you push it too high. So on Xbox Series S and X, one frame is typically the sweet spot where you get lower input lag without sacrificing visual fidelity. Next up, expect headered ROMs for IPS patches. This is set to off by default, but if you have a headered IPS patched ROM, you can turn it on to get that ROM hack to work. Next up, HD Mode 7 Scaling. This is set to 2x by default to give your Mode 7 games a more crisp appearance. You can turn this off, go back down to native resolution, or you can crank it up to see how far you can push it before your game starts to exhibit performance issues. Again, 960p to 1440p are usual sweet spots for most titles, and they provide a really nice look, but with BSNES HD selecting to run these games in widescreen, 1440p is a bit too demanding for Super Mario Kart this time around, so I'm just going to go ahead and scale this back down to 960p. And there we go. Full speed achieved once again. And as you can see, the game is running in a widescreen format, which is interesting. It does have asset culling at the 4x3 barriers. But anyway, perspective correction, this is set to auto widescreen by default. You could go through and change it up if desired. So not much difference in Mario Kart between the options or you could turn off perspective correction to begin with, but that can cause issues with uh, the widescreen patch. So just recommend leaving it on auto. Next up, super sampling. This one works a bit differently than standard BSNES and even at 2x can cause some undesirable lag in a lot of titles, so just recommend leaving this one off for the most case. Next up, HD to SD Mosaic. Leave this on 1x scale if you plan on using any widescreen options. Next up, HD Background Color Radius. So this is set to 4 by default. I believe it gives pretty good results on the games that I've tried, but you can increase it to get better color smoothness or you can turn it off. Personal preference. HD Windowing. This is an experimental option, so it is off by default, but you can turn it on and see what kind of effects it will have in your games. For Super Mario Kart here, not much of a difference. Next up, widescreen mode. So this is where you can set your widescreen options initially. So it's on for mode 7 games by default, but you can enable it for all Super Nintendo games with different results. Then you can set your widescreen aspect ratio. There's a number of different ones available. 21 by 9. And our next set of options are specific to widescreen renderings. So we have background layer manipulation, sprite manipulation, area background colors, window effects, X coordinates, markers, alpha markers, and stretching the window. So the effect each of these options will have on different games is going to be determined by the game itself. But when it comes to running SNES games in widescreen, you're really better off finding a dedicated widescreen hack that works in conjunction with BSNES HD to get the optimal results. So for today's video example, I want to give you one such option with Super Mario World. So Vitor Villela has created a widescreen patch for Super Mario World to run with BSNES HD to give you a proper widescreen implementation of this classic title. So I'm just going to download the latest version here and show you how to get it up and running. All right, so here we go. Super Mario World widescreen patch. Just going to go ahead and get this one extracted. And inside the folder, we have a readme on how to apply the patch, as well as a couple of options to choose from. So there's going to be a BPS patch and a BSO patch for each option. So there's extra wide per pixel aspect ratio, extra wide raw, 
and standard widescreen pixel aspect ratio and widescreen raw. So there is a screenshot available for each version of the patch so you can choose which one you want to use. So for today's example, I'm going to go with the widescreen pixel aspect ratio. So here we go, widescreen pixel aspect ratio. And here's the BPS file I need to apply to my Super Mario ROM. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete the other ones out of here real quick. So that way I just have the one I want. There we go. So now we just need to apply our patch to our ROM and romhacker.net actually has a nice web tool to apply ROM patches now. So link to that will be in the description below for anyone interested. So essentially we're just going to go ahead and choose our ROM file. So we're going to select Super Mario World from our Xbox USB drive. There we go. And now we're going to choose our patch file. And I have this one on my desktop inside Super Mario World widescreen. And there it is, our BPS patch, perfect. So we're gonna go ahead and tell it to apply the patch and it will download a patched version of the ROM to our computer. All right, so here we go, Super Mario World USA patched. So I'm just gonna add this to my Super Mario widescreen folder here real quick. And now we could go ahead and delete the BPS patch. All we need is the BSO file here, but we need to have it match the file name of our ROM. So I'm just gonna go ahead and rename this one Super Mario World widescreen. Get rid of our region code here. There we go, Super Mario World widescreen. I'm gonna select the file name here. Copy that and rename our BSO file after it. There we go. And then I'm just gonna rename the folder that I have them all in after that same file name. There we go and add it to my Super Nintendo games folder on my Xbox USB drive. So there we go, it is now ready to go. But once you have the patched ROM set up and on your Xbox USB drive, just move it back over to the Xbox. Now there's two ways of going about to load this up. You could go into load content again, or you could add it to your Super Nintendo games playlist, which is what I'm gonna do right now. Gonna go back into import content, manual scan, content directory, I'm going to choose my Super Nintendo games folder. And then I'm going to go into that Super Mario World widescreen folder here and tell it to scan that directory. System name is going to be Nintendo Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And default core, I'm going to set this to BSNES HD because that is the only core it's actually going to run in. So here we go, SNES, BSNES HD beta, there we go. And for file extensions, I'm just gonna put that SFC extension again, so that way it doesn't read that BSO file by chance. And good to help to start the scan. So there we go, now inside of my game's playlist, I now have an entry for Super Mario World widescreen. So let's give it a shot, see what it looks like. And there we go, Super Mario World in true widescreen. What a sight to behold. So again, while you can get some widescreen hack capabilities out of the BSNES HD core on a per game basis using the provided settings, using these pre-patched games is definitely the way to go about doing it. But with that, we've now covered all the core options within BSNES HD beta. So as always, if there's options you wanna have saved for some games but not others, you can come up to manage core options and save them as a game options file. Otherwise, everything is just applied on a core wide basis. All right, next up we're gonna cover SNES 9X. So just gonna start with Super Mario World here. And SNES 9X is the only core that we're covering today that does support retro achievements. So if you're a retro achievements fan, this is gonna be your go-to core. So overall, SNES 9X is a perfectly playable core. While not as accurate as BSNES, there is going to be very few games where you're gonna be able to really notice a difference. But let's go ahead and dive into the core options for this one. So going back into our RetroArch Quick Menu, Core Options. Our first option is to choose our console's region. So this is set to Auto by default, but you can manually select between NTSC and PAL if needed. Next, Preferred Aspect Ratio, set to 4x3 by default, but you can do a 4x3 Preserved Aspect Ratio, an Uncorrected Aspect Ratio, Auto Aspect Ratio, or NTSC, 
and pal. So again, I'm a big fan of four by three, so that's what I go with. Next up, crop overscan. This is set to eight pixels by default, but you can change it up to 12 pixels if you wanna have a slightly better integer scale with the expense of cropping more of the image or 16, or you could turn it off. Next up, high res blending. So this is used to produce transparency effects in certain titles. So I like to turn this one on. Doesn't really affect other games, but does wonders for those games that need the effect. Next up, Blarg NTSC filter. So this lets you mimic a number of output options for your video signal, including monochrome, RF, composite, S-video, and RGB. So you could use these if you don't want to use RetroArch's built-in shaders, otherwise leave them off and use RetroArch's built-in shader effects. Next up, audio interpolation. This will change how the output of your audio sounds, so you can change between all of the options available here. It's personal preference, which one you like. Gaussian would technically be the more accurate option, but again, it's all personal preference, so use whichever you desire. Next up, allow opposing directions. This one isn't really going to be needed by standard use cases, but if you want to mess around with glitching and different things like that, you can turn this option on. Next up, emulation hacks. So our first option here is Super FX Clocking. So if you wanna play Star Fox at faster than 10 FPS, you can overclock the Super FX chip to get a faster frame rate out of it. Next up, Reduce Slowdown. This is essentially overclocking the emulated Super Nintendo CPU. Again, it can cause problems in some games, so use at your own risk. Next up, Reduce Flickering. So this is to get rid of the sprite limit. So if you have games that have flickering from too many sprites being on a single scan line, you can turn this option off to get rid of the flickering. Next up, randomize memory. Go ahead and leave this one off unless you want to experiment with what it does to certain games. Next up, block invalid VRAM access. This is on by default, but if you're doing older ROM hacks, you will want to turn it off to get it to work. Followed by the echo buffer hack, which is again needed for older ROM hacks. We're going to go ahead and skip the light gun stuff because again, I just have never been able to get it to work on the Xbox and head down to advanced audio and video settings. So this is where you're able to just really come in and have some fun if you are making SNES game maps or mapping how the sound channels work on specific games. So for example, we could turn off layer one in Super Mario World here and remove the entirety of our foreground. Layer two gets rid of our background. Layer three gets rid of our HUD. And layer four doesn't seem to be an effect on this level. So again, if you wanna just map what different things look like, you can easily set these options here. And then again, you can turn off different sound channels as desired. And with that, we've covered all the core options available to us within SNES 9X. So as always, if there's some options you wanna have set for some games, but not others, you can head up manage core options and save them as a game options file. But SNES 9X does have other advantages for us as well, and that includes easier MSU1 audio hacks. So if you have MSU1 games, SNES 9X is definitely the core to use to run them easily. And as you can hear, it sounds just fine on the Xbox Series X and S. But now let's go ahead and cover our fourth Super Nintendo emulator core within RetroArch on Xbox Series X and S, and this time it is going to be Messin S. So I'm just gonna set my default core to that for Super Mario World here and load it up. And Messin S can support some retro achievements for some games, but not others. So again, I do recommend using SNES 9X if you wanna do all retro achievements without issues. But Messin S does attempt to be a more accurate Super Nintendo core and overall it does a pretty good job. But let's go ahead and dive into the core options available to us. So first up, NTSC filter. So these are all the Blarg filters, so you can do composite, S-video, RGB, or monochrome. So you can choose to use these or RetroArch's internal shaders, your preference. Next up, regions set to auto by default, but you can manually change to NTSC or PAL if needed. We're going to skip over the Game Boy model and Super Game Boy 2 stuff because, again, there are better ways of accessing Super Game Boy content within the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch that we will cover in our Game Boy video. 
Next, you could set vertical and horizontal overscan options. So eight and 16 pixels are available. Next up, aspect ratio. So no stretching will give you the eight by seven output. Otherwise you can set it to NTSC, PAL, four by three, or stretch it to 16 by nine. So I'm a four by three guy, there we go. Next up, blend high res modes. Recommend turning that one on to get proper transparency effects for certain titles. Next, cubic interpolation. This will filter the output of the audio, personal preference if you like it or not. Next, we have CPU overclocking for our emulated Super Nintendo. So you could set this option to low, medium, high, or very high. This can cause some issues in certain games, so use at your own risk, but it can remove slowdown in demanding titles. As for the overclocking type, leave this one on before NMI. Next, we can overclock the Super FX chip, so number of options here to reduce slowdown in games like Star Fox. Again, it's a use at your own risk type of a deal. Next up, default power on state for RAM. This is set to random by default, but you can set it to all zeros or all ones just to see what it does to your titles. And finally, use HLE coprocessors for emulation. You can turn this option on or off, shouldn't matter too much, but we are using HLE emulation throughout this entire tutorial, so it might be better to turn it on so that way your coprocessor games will load correctly. And with that, we have now covered all of the Messin S core options. So as always, if there's options you wanna have set for some games but not others, you can head up to manage core options and save them as a game options file. Next, I wanna cover some control options that you can use within most of the Super Nintendo cores available. So within our RetroArch Quick menu in the Controls tab, if you head down to Port 1 Controls, you can see that there's some options that you can change between. So unfortunately, the Xbox version of RetroArch doesn't support mouse input currently, so we can't emulate the Super Nintendo mouse yet. But heading into port two controls, you can see that there are things like the multi-tap that you can take advantage of to get more multiplayer games up and running. So for example, um, what was it? Secret of Mana allowed for three player gameplay and then Super Bomberman games allowed up to what, five players, six players? I don't know off the top of my head, I don't play that game, sorry. But for anyone looking to take advantage of extended multiplayer capabilities of the Super Nintendo, besides beyond the two port options, the control tab will have your multi-tap that you could then set up, set your controls for, and get up and running for multiplayer gameplay. And finally, the last option I plan to cover in this video is the use of shaders. RetroArch has an extensive shader library that lets you come in, enable, and load just any number of effects that you could desire. So there are a ton of options to choose from. Shaders are a personal preference deal. So a couple of my favorite options. My number one go-to is always to use CRT Easy Mode. Gives a really nice CRT gridline effect, scanline effect. Not too much blurring, but enough to kind of blend the dithered pixels together, which is really nice. I really like the way this one looks. And again, it is easy mode. For more advanced CRT options, you can also come in here and use the uh, Royal shaders. So CRT Royal is another really good one. And if you want a more CRT look with like geometry stuff, you could also come in and use the CRT geometry shaders. So these ones will give you kind of the bending along the corners of the screen to more accurately mimic older CRT TVs. And it comes pretty close to the look of the CRT easy mode shader as well. So keeps a bit of the crispness that emulation gives your game, but just a cool effect to mess with. But again, shaders are all personal preference, so just choose whichever one you like the most, and once you've found it, go back into the shader tab, click on the save button, and you can save them as a core preset, so that way every time you load up a Super Nintendo game within that core, that will be the shader that greets you. You will need to do this for every Super Nintendo core that you plan to use if you are going to be using more than one. And there you have it, four Super Nintendo emulation cores available to you to use within the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. Whether you're a fan of accuracy, widescreen hacks, MSC1 audio packs, retro achievements, there is an option for you that will work very well.
But thank you so much as always for watching today's tutorial. I hope it helps you get your Super Nintendo emulation projects up and running to your desires. But here at the end, I do have a couple of big favors to ask. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to hit that thumbs up, thumbs down button, depending on how much you like today's video, as well as that sub button and notification bell so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. Loads of content always coming your way, and I'd love to have each and every one of you along for the ride. For anyone interested in further helping support the channel and keep this going, you can check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little goes a long way to keeping this place up and running and bringing all of this content directly to you. Big thank you to all of our current backers, thank you again so much for believing what we do here and helping us keep it going, you are the truest of champs. But until next time my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, keep on gaming, and we will see you back next video.